Now coming to management principles. When we talk about management principles, there are basically two approaches. There are two people who've developed principles. One is Henry Fuel. He's developed 14 principles of management, right? Which are generally these principles. They are applicable for the general administration, right? And there was there's another person that is. Taylor's uh, principle, he's basically worked on scientific management, okay, and these principles and uh, Taylor's principles are basically meant for, they are more for the operational or supervisory level of management, right. Coming to Fjord's principle, first principle when we talk about is division of work and specialization. Now, as an organization grows in size, as an organization grows in size, it becomes important to divide the entire work into smaller pieces. Right? And each piece of the work is going to be handled by a specialist or a trained employee. Now, if a specialist or a trained employee is handling only his part of the job, right, he will be able to do that job in the most effective and efficient manner. We take the example, I think I have taken this example before as well. We take the example of uh, your class bulletin board. Right? I do that as a teacher in my class. Right? If I have to design the uh, class board, Right now, a border has to be put up. That is something a person who's good at artwork will be able to do it really well. Right, so I give it to a person who's good at that. Right, then some written material is required. All right, a person who has a good handwriting will be given the task of writing that material, and a person who has a niche for I mean, who's creative, who's cre who has a who has a niche for creative writing, who can write well on his own, he'll be given the task of actually giving the material to the person who's going to pen it down on the paper, right? Then some caricatures and some other uh, drawings and everything which is to be made, that again is going to be given to the person who's good at, who has, who has, a, who has a poncho for drawing, right? Then, then a person who uh, has a sense of putting up the board, I mean, kya cheez kaha lagni chahiye, kaise achha lagni, the basic aesthetic sense, who has a good aesthetic sense, I'm going to give him the task of putting up the board. Ki kaun si caption kaha jayegi, kaun si drawing kaha jayegi, right, heading hum kaha lagayenge, kaise lagayenge, right, and neatly, jo ki mera plastic sheet uske upar pin up kar sake. So what, I have, what have I done, I'm explaining it to you at a very micro level. What have I done, I have divided the entire work of putting up the class board into smaller tasks wherein each task is being taken care of by a specialist. And what is my end result that I'm going to get a beautiful board done, right, at the least possible cost. Okay, cost kya hoga yaha pe? I'm not talking about paise ki tabaad nahi kar rahi yaha pe, time bhi kam lagega. Why? Because they are good at that work, so they are going to take less time. Clear? So, second principle is authority and responsibility. What is authority? Authority is the right to give orders and obtain obedience. Okay? It is the right, I repeat, it is the right to give orders and obtain obedience. Ki maine kaha hai, to ye mana jana chahiye. Because I am the principal of the school, that's why whatever I am saying is right and you must do it. This is authority. Right? What is responsibility? Responsibility is obligation to perform the assigned duties on time. Because the principal has said it, so I must do it. Because the principal has said it, I must do it. It becomes my responsibility. Now, according to Fjord, there has to be a parity between authority and responsibility. If you are making a person responsible for a task, right, without giving him sufficient amount of authority, that per, that that worker is going to turn ineffective. That worker is going to be turned ineffective, right? So therefore, if you are assigning responsibility of a task, he must be given sufficient amount, he must be given sufficient amount of authority for him to be effective and efficient. For example, if the production manager is to achieve a target of manufacturing about 10,000 units in a month, right? It is his responsibility to achieve this target, right? But if he is not given the authority to file for requisition of tools and material, 
right then he is going to turn ineffective he will not be able to achieve his target on time because every time for that he will have to achieve uh, he will have to approach his top manager so if you are giving him this kind of a responsibility you must give him the required amount of authority so that he can make a requisition for raw material and tools at the desired time similarly like we say responsibility without authority has no meaning similarly authority without responsibility is also meaningless it may be misused it may be misused if you have given the authority to a sales uh, sales manager to given uh, to give a credit period of 60 days theek hai agar usko responsibility nahi di hai ki within these 60 days agar paise aa jane chahiye right if you have given him sales manager requires to offer a credit period for 60 days to negotiate a deal with the buyer he or she should not be given the authority to offer a credit period of 100 days he may misuse this authority so there has to be just a right combination of authority and responsibility agar kisi ko responsibility di hai to uske sath usko sufficient amount of authority bhi di jani chahiye so that he is able to carry out that task in the most another thing authority can be delegated but responsibility you can never absolve yourself from the responsibility next discipline what is the meaning of the word discipline you must have heard this being in school you must have heard of this word umpteen number of times discipline it means obedience obedience to organizational rules and employment agreement which are necessary for the working of an organization now discipline requires good superiors at all levels clear and fair agreements judicious application of penalties when we say discipline we say obedience of organizational rules and employment agreement right let us talk of a situation wherein uh, the workers okay of an organization they have agreed that they are not going to charge any extra money for overtime in an organization to help the organization come out of a particular loss and in return of which the organization has promised the day it starts to make profits it is going to give 5% of its profits to its workers as bonus it is going to distribute 5% of its profits to the workers as bonus now the principle of discipline would require that if the workers are abiding by these terms and conditions then the management must also abide by these terms and conditions that is when they start earning profits they must give 5% of their profits to the workers it has to be not only not only for the workers but also for the management then comes unity of command now principle of unity of command means that each worker must receive orders only from one boss because if i am receiving orders from two bosses okay i am going to be in a fix the worker is going to be in a fix ki kiska kaam main pehle karu boss a bolega pehle mera kaam karo boss b bolega pehle mera kaam karo but what about the employee for him both are at par a and b are at par right so to avoid this kind of a situation they all said that each employee must receive directions from one boss only clear then comes the principle of unity of direction this principle states that all the units of an organization all the units of an organization should be working in the same direction that is towards the accomplishment of organizational goals for example if let's say an organization or a company is manufacturing motorcycles and cars right so both these two products okay they should be taken up as two different units they should be taken up as two different units having their own goals and objectives right but at the same times they both the units should be moving in the same direction that is towards the accomplishment of the goals and objectives of the organization as a whole right then subordination of individual interest to general this is a very important point at all points of time you know the 
whatever decisions, all decisions that are being taken, they should be taken keeping the organization's interest in mind. They should be taken keeping the organization's interest in mind. That means organizational interest is always going to take precedence over individual interest. In case of strikes, you know, what that is strike pitch jate hai, workers who have demands. Rakte hai. Now, if the workers are interested in getting higher salaries by doing the minimum work, right? This is in the interest of the individual worker. But is it in the interest of the organization? No, it's not in the interest of the organization, and hence this demand of the workers should not be accepted. Right? Only those demands of the workers will be accepted which are in the interest of the organization. We are talking about the organization. We are not saying which should be in the interest of the management. We are talking about we are talking about the benefit of the organization, benefit of the organization. So individual interest will always, there should always be subordination of individual interest to general. Pehle hum organization ke interest ka sochenge, uske baad hum individual interest ka sochenge. But iska matlab ye nahi hai that, you know, a man, it is a job of the manager that in the pursuance or in the pursuance of the organizational objectives, he must make sure that he is able to help, you know, the employees achieve their own personal goals. When we talk about their own personal goals, meaning their social objectives of being recognized for the good work being done, career growth objectives, that is wherever it is possible, if he is working really well, then to give him promotions and recognition at the right time. <clears throat> so, individual, there should always be subordination of individual interest to general interest. Next, remuneration of employees. When we talk about remuneration of employees, it's important that the employees of an organization, the they are being given salaries which are just and equitable. Just and just means he gets what he deserves, right? The kind of the services that he is rendering, right? He should be compensated for the services that he is rendering to the organization. And when we say equitable, just and equitable, equitable means he should be given a competitive salary. Meaning, if a production manager is being in our company is being given a salary of let's say about 2 lakh rupees per month, right? It should be a competitive salary. That means in the same industry, in other companies also the production managers are being given the same salary or maybe less, right? So he should be given just and equitable salary. Next, this is a very, very important topic, centralization and decentralization. Centralization means retention of authority at the top level of management. Retention of authority at the top level of management, meaning all decisions are taken up by the top level of the management only, be it a big decision or a small routine decision, all decisions are taken by the top level of management. And decentralization of authority means delegation of authority at all levels of organization. You give the desired level of authority to all the three levels of management. That means top level management is only going to retain the authority to frame the broad uh, objectives and goals of the organization for framing the policies of the organization. Middle level management okay, is going to have the authority for translation of those objectives and goals into the work which is required to be done. Right? And the supervisory level of management will also have the required level of authority. Now, in any organization, there shouldn't be a complete centralization or complete decentralization. Fiol says that organization should have a balance between complete centralization and decentralization. Like I just said, that the major decisions that is of setting goals and objectives of an organization or formulation of plans and policies should always be retained by the top level management, right? <clears throat> but there can be a policy for decentralization uh, for the activities of routine work such as purchase of raw material, assignment of targets to workers, etc. These can be decentralized. Then 